after his entitled the disappearance of Lord Krishna. Hmm. So um, I'll read the Sanskrit first and then we'll do the word for word. Sutta Uvacha. Sutta Uvacha. Samprastite Dwarakayam. Samprastite Dwarakayam. Samprastite Dwarakayam. Samprastite Dwarakayam. Jishnau Bandhu Didrik Shaya. Jishnau Bandhu Didrik Shaya. Jishnau Bandhu Didrik Shaya. Jishna Bandhu the Drikshaya Yam Tamcha Punyaslokasya Gyatumcha Punyaslokasya Yam Tamcha Punyaslokasya Gyatumcha Punyaslokasya Krishna sya cha vichestitam Krishna sya cha vichestitam Krishna sya cha vichestitam Krishna sya cha Samprastite Dwarakayam Jishno Bandhu Dadrikshaya Gyatum Cha Punya Shlokasya Krishna Sya Cha Vichestitam Sutta Uvacha Samprastite Dwarakayam Jishno Bandhu Tadrikshaya Gyatum Cha Punya Shlokasya Krishna Sya Cha Vichestitam Sutta Uvacha. Sri Sutta Goswami said. Sri Sutta Goswami said. Samprastite. Samprastite. Having gone to. Having gone to. Dwarya. Dwarya Kayam. Dwarya Kayam. The city of Dwarka. The city of Dwarka. Jishnau. Jishnau. Arjuna. Arjuna. Bandhu. Bandhu. Friends and relatives. Friends and relatives. Didrikshaya Didrikshaya From eating them From eating them Yantam Yantam To know To know Cha Cha Also Also Punya Shlokasha Punya Shlokasha Of one whose glories are sung by Vedic hymns Of one whose glories are sung by Vedic hymns Krishnasya Krishnasya Of Lord Krishna Of Lord Krishna Cha Cha And And Vichestitam Further programs of work Further programs of work Translation Translation of what provides the mind by Stacey Bhaktivinoda Swami Shri Sutta Goswami said Arjuna went to Dwarka to see Lord Sri Krishna and other friends and also to learn from the Lord of his next activities Purport as stated in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord descended on earth for the protection of the faithful and annihilation of the impious. So after the battle of Kukshetra and establishment of Maharaj Yudhisthira, the mission of the Lord was complete. The Pandavas, especially Sri Arjuna, were eternal companions of the Lord, and therefore Arjuna went to Dwarka to hear from the Lord of his next program of work. Text 2. Translation. A few months
months passed, and Arjuna did not return. Maharaj Yudhisthira then began to observe some inauspicious omens, which were fearful in themselves. Four, Lord Sri Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is ad infinitum, more powerful than the most powerful sun of our experience. Millions and billions of suns are created by him and annihilated by him within his one breathing period. In the material world, the sun is considered to be the source of all productivity and material energy. And only due to the sun can we have the necessities of life. Therefore, during the personal presence of the Lord on the earth, all paraphernalia for our peace and prosperity, especially religion and knowledge, were in full display because of the Lord's presence, just as there is a full flood of light in the presence of the glowing sun. Maharaj Yudhisthira observed some discrepancies in his kingdom, and therefore he became very anxious about Arjuna, who was long absent, and there was also no news about Dwarka's well-being. He suspected the disappearance of Lord Krishna. Otherwise, there would have been no possibility of fearful omens. activity to do here. 
And so of his own free will, he's not forced to come here. He comes here. And he comes here in designated time frames, and he comes in different incarnations. He appears as Krishna, as Lord Ram. He appears as Bhavanade. He appears as Vishingade. He, he's got many appearances. And he comes. Always his mission is always to uplift us. To wake us up, to enlighten us, and to have us really find out who are we? Why are we here? You know, where do we belong? We're all trying to find community, we're all trying to find connection, and uh, we're really missing our connection with Krishna, and we're really missing our community. Uh, of us, of devotees in the spiritual world. And we're so missing, so we keep searching. Sometimes not in the right places. So Krishna appears to uplift, and he also comes to kind of clear a space for upliftment. Because in the material world, which we can experience on an everyday basis, things seem to break down, right? Cars break down. If you have a house or apartment, things break. Faucets break. Sometimes cabinets break. Sometimes microphones break, fall and break. Things break down. They deteriorate. And not only do material things deteriorate, but Consciousness also deteriorates. Ultimately, our consciousness is pure, and we are completely aware of our connection and our, our, that we are part and parcel of Krishna and that our Dharma is service to the Supreme Lord and his parts and parcels. And yet, as time passes, the covering of individual consciousness and the collective consciousness of the world becomes degraded. That's why we have four yugas. Sakti yuga is the age of everyone's Krishna conscious. And then we progress, and now we're in Kali yuga. And in Kali yuga, it's called the age of quarrel and confusion. How many of you have experienced quarrel and confusion in this age? Yeah, a whole lot of that. We get confused. We don't know what to do. We get, we're fighting and we don't even know why we're fighting and we don't even want to fight and we're fighting. So quarrel and confusion. So Krishna comes, he appears, to kind of clear away those that are propagating impious activities and those that are perpetuating the degradation of society at large. And he clears the space so that when he implants, whatever he implants, he's coming to implant and uplift so that those plants of spiritual knowledge and, and, um, and the love that he comes to give us that he can take fruit, at least for some point, some time. So he comes to clear away the impious and to uplift and protect the pious and the devotees. That's why he appears. And Arjuna is one of his eternal associates. So Arjuna took part in the clearing. Arjuna was a warrior in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and he had one heck of a service. <laughs> he had to partake in um, a battle which he didn't really want to partake in because it involved his relatives and his teachers and his grandfather, and they were on the opposing side. And this really was heart-wrenching for him. But Krishna 
Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna let him know, no, this is my plan. We need to clear away the impious. We need to clear away the mentalities that are really suffocating the souls that are pious. And I've already killed their bodies. Like, it's my intention and it's going to happen whether you participate or not. Krishna doesn't need us to do anything. Just If you just think something, it happens in a second. But he engages us in his service. So Arjuna had that service. And then when that service was complete and the battle was over, Krishna's activities were also complete for this for his appearance in this in this particular time frame as Krishna. So that's where we are, and Arjuna went to find Krishna and see what's next. And he'd been gone for many months, and his brother Yudhisthira, King Yudhisthira, who was now ruling <coughs> over the earth, he had been um, crowned in charge of the earth. This point, um, he was distraught because he saw that things were changing. When Krishna was here, he it just his presence was like the presence of millions and billions of suns. When we're cold and we're inside a cold building and the sun is shining outside, we can just go out and in the sunlight itself, we can feel the warmth and the energy of the sun. We can feel the healing rays of the sun. We can feel the power of the sun, and it can enliven us and refresh us. So when Krishna appears, he enlivens everyone. In Vrindavan, all the creepers, all the trees, everything is enlivened just by his, his presence. He is the supreme energetic. From, from Krishna, all energy emanates. The energy of the impersonal Brahman, all the individual parts and parcels, all of our energy comes from Krishna. And in that connection with our source, we feel enlightened and energized. But can you here notice some inauspicious moments. He could feel something wasn't right. It's not the same. Just like Krishna gives us feeling, even in our own bodies, right? And when we feel healthy, you could say it feels normal. That's the homeostasis of the body. When we feel healthy, you know, we can function better. One day we may feel <clears throat> my throat is a little scratchy. <clears throat> we may feel exhausted, tired. We may not start to sneeze and cough. So we know something's going on. Something's out of balance with our body. So when our Judah didn't come back and we just do notice all these inauspicious signs. Something's not right. He feared that Lord Krishna had disappeared. And we will find out more details, but since the title is the chapter, the, the, the title of the chapter is the disappearance of Lord Krishna. We can know that Lord Krishna has disappeared. Now, just as Krishna does not take birth, he appears. When Krishna leaves, he's not dead, he's not gone. He's just disappearing from our vision. He's just disappearing. 
fear of conversation. And we may feel the separation of him not being here because there is a difference between his personal presence and when he's gone. So what does the disappearance of Lord Krishna elicit in the, in the hearts of the devotees? When Lord Krishna disappeared from the gopis and the rasakas, when Lord Krishna goes home to Mother Yasoda and disappears from the cowherd boys, or in the morning when Lord Krishna leaves his mother Yasoda and disappears and goes with the cowherd boys, at some point in time, some of his associates are experiencing his disappearance. So, when Krishna disappears from the physical sight of his devotees, what do devotees do? Does anybody know? What do devotees do when Krishna disappears? Call out his name. They Call out his name. Him. They think of him. They think of him. Anybody else? Cry. They cry. Anybody else? They think of him. They call his names. They think of his activities. They, they cry, but they cry in a singing way. Their cry is a yearning. It's a yearning when we come back, but they're also crying in joy because they're singing songs, and they make up songs and poetry about his activities. So they're remembering him in great detail. They're recreating. That's their recreation. Their recreation is recreating the activities of the Lord and bringing them up in their consciousness and having them manifest in their consciousness so that Krishna's appearing in their consciousness. He's appearing in their words, in their songs, in their praise, in their cries. And so, it, it behooves us that in the presence of Radha and Chandra, we can see their beautiful forms and we can appreciate their loving glances and how they glance upon us and bless us they are appearing in front of us. And then when we leave the temple, sometimes we, we go out into the world. We, we have jobs. We have places that we have to go. We may not see that form in front of us. And so it behooves us to recreate and try to remember that form. What was Krishna? What was Radhanam Chandra? wearing this morning, you know? Was he wearing a marigold garland? Or was it a rose garland? Or, you know, did Radharani have decorations in her hair? Did she have flowers in her hair? You know, was she holding a flower for Krishna? Or was she holding a basket? Was she holding a fan? What was she doing this morning when she was appearing with with Vrindavan Chandra. And this remembrance, <coughs> the remembrance of the details, and the more details we remember, the more our consciousness can be filled <coughs> with a picture. The more someone writes and describes in detail the colors and the shapes and the forms, the more detail there is the more we can get a picture in our head of the, of, of the personality of God and we can get that picture. And then we can look at that picture and, and, and feel the Lord's presence, presence in our mind. And then we can feel the Lord's presence in our heart because we can feel the connection. Our heart which yearns for connection with Krishna can feel the Lord's presence. 
And so then the Lord appears again in our consciousness. He appears in our prayers. He appears as we chant and call out to him. There are different ways to chant. And the amount of intensity and focus with which we chant can determine how much Krishna will be present to us personally. When we chant Krishna's name, if we are thinking about what we're going to do today, that may take precedence in our consciousness, and that may actually be where our consciousness is. And so we may be, our, our lips may be calling out to Krishna, but if we're not present in our consciousness, even if Krishna comes to us, we won't see his appearance because our consciousness is focused in a different place. If I'm looking over here, looking at this chair, I don't see Krishna. He's not there because I'm not focused. I'm not present to his, his pure appearance here in the altar. My mind is elsewhere. So as we chant Krishna's names in the morning, do, do you, does, does everybody here chant a little bit? Do we all chant a little bit Krishna's names sometimes? We chant in the morning. It's a good way to start the day. Because when we chant in the morning, we're calling out to our Creator, our Father, our, our, um, our dear most friend. And we're calling out in gratitude. Thank you so much. You've made this day. You've made me. You've given me the ability to love. You've given me the ability to connect. Um, thank you. We start our day with gratitude and acknowledgement. You've given me life. You're maintaining my life with so many things in so many ways. And you've given me love and inspiration. And so when we acknowledge that and we are grateful for that in our chanting, we can feel Krishna's presence. We can feel him present with us. And that's inspiring. It's enlivening. And it, it gives us strength to deal with the world of Kali that is full of quarrel and confusion. So we can enter this world of quarrel and confusion and misery and distress. And we can bring a heart, a loving heart filled with Krishna's love. And we can bring that to others. So just like Hurricane Dorian has really created a lot of disaster for so many people. Our presence and our prayers can be sent and our love can be sent. Nothing can separate us from Krishna except our consciousness. So, um, I just wanted to really emphasize the importance of calling Krishna, calling out to Krishna every morning, having him appear in our lives, and carrying him with us throughout the day so we can share Krishna with others, with others who may not be so fortunate, with others who may not know, and with others who are experiencing um, great distress and miseries. And, and then even if Krishna disappears from our sight, we can call him into our consciousness. So um, I'd like to just 
leave some time for some comments. I mean, I'm sure that maybe people have some other things that they heard in the verse, some comments, some questions, or any corrections. Anybody want to say anything? Teacher, teacher, do we have anything? Any thoughts? That was the example you gave of the sun, actually, in the purple one, right? The sun. Maybe millions of suns, it says there? I think it says, uh, let's see, it says. Uh, millions and billions yes. of suns are, oh, created, yes. are created by them. Uh, he's more powerful than the most powerful sun. Uh, the appearance of the Lord is sometimes compared to this, the day uh, of the sun rising and the sun setting. Uh -huh. For the ignorant person, they think the sun is rising or the sun is setting. But actually, for those who are above the fray, so to speak, Papa Jews example of flying in an airplane. You can see that the sun is shining always because he's in the So Krishna's Krishna he doesn't disappear, like I said, he doesn't appear or disappear. He is eternally present. <coughs> but to us, just like the sun is appearing and disappearing. For us, but actually the sun is constantly glowing giving its full <coughs> power to the universe. So that personal experience of Pan Dad was, a, was part of a person's lila so that they can uh, feel separation, which is, as you were describing in the class, the highest types of feelings for the devotee. But in that feeling of separation, Krishna becomes more present. Because the consciousness is absorbed. There's a saying in English, um, familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> and so sometimes devotees uh, that are living in the community and they get to see the deities and then suddenly they have to go away out on traveling or something and they don't have an opportunity and then they come back after some time and like, oh, Krishna's so much more beautiful. <laughs> so that separation actually increases the healing of love. Yes. Thank you. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. This lady here has a question. Thank you for sharing.